<clears throat> okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to this uh, IOP talk uh, on the topic of solving the quandary of the quark uh, given by Professor Christine Davies of the University uh, of Glasgow. Uh, so uh, just before we get started, uh, I'd like to give some, uh, some present some introductory material. Uh, so firstly, uh, I just like <clears throat> so 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 uh, firstly, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Maciej Matuszewski. I'm one of the branch secretaries of the Northeast branch of the Institute of Physics. Uh, and I'd like to also uh, uh, make a make a brief note for our IOP members who 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 may be in the audience today, and that is about uh, uh, nominations to IOP committees. So the national, regional branch, and special interest group committees uh, of the IOP open the annual committee nominations on the 1st of June. So that's this upcoming Tuesday. We are building a thriving, diverse physics community, and we welcome nominations that reflect and celebrate the diversity of communities across the UK and Ireland, and particularly encourage nominations from underrepresented groups. So if you're a member of the IOP, keep your eyes peeled for an email in your inbox about committee nominations on Tuesday. So this coming Tuesday, the 1st of June. Uh, so I would also like to give thanks to our friends at the uh, Lytton Phil Society in Newcastle who have their own uh, a series of, of talks but also help uh, support our talks. Uh, if you search Lytton Phil Newcastle uh, you'll be able to find their website and find uh, their uh, talk schedule. So uh, finally, just some uh, practicalities, uh, just to uh, let you know that this uh, talk is being recorded and will be put up on our YouTube channel. Uh, however, don't worry, you are all muted, uh, and uh, so, 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 so we won't, uh, uh, we, we won't uh, see you and we won't uh, see your names on the public broadcast. Uh, uh, this means that uh, at the end, when you wish to ask questions, uh, you will only be able to do that either through the chat facility or the questions facility uh, on uh, GoToWebinar. And we recommend that, that you use the questions facility. That just makes things uh, a bit easier to collect the questions. Uh, but feel free to use the, the, the general chat facility uh, if you have any, any problems during, during the talk, if you have any technical issues, and we, we will try to uh, resolve those as best as we can. So uh, uh, thank you. I hope you enjoy the talk. And I would like to introduce Professor uh, Christine Davies from the uh, School of Physics and Astronomy at uh, uh, Glasgow University. Uh, Professor Davies studies uh, uh, the strong nuclear force, uh, which is the force that uh, governs, uh, that, that it's one of the forces that governs the behavior of uh, subatomic particles called quarks. And uh, the, the, indeed, the topic of uh, the talk today is solving the quandary of a quark. Thank you. Great, thanks very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Christine Davis from the University of Glasgow. I hope you can hear me OK. I hope you can see my cursor as well for, for pointing on the screen. Thank you for connecting to hear me tell you something about solving the quandary of the quark. So I'm going to start with a, a general introduction to um, particle physics, and I'll talk a bit about the strong interaction and the issues that that causes for quarks. And then I'll talk about how we can solve that using numerical techniques that go under the general name of lattice QCD, which is why I've got a lattice here for the background uh, picture. And then I'll tell you something about some recent calculations that my collaboration have done, the high precision QCD collaboration um, using lattice QCD and what impact that has had on our understanding of particle physics. OK, so let's start with some generalities. I mean, one of one of the key aims of particle physics, as you, as you probably know, is to uncover the fundamental particles and interactions at the smallest distance scales. So if we start uh, with an atom at the size scale of a nanometer, say, 10 to the minus 9 meters, uh, we've got a cloud of electrons around the nucleus, and it's easy uh, to remove one of those electrons. It's just held by uh, electric interactions to uh, the positively charged nucleus. 
Is the electron a fundamental particle? As far as we know, at the moment it is. But if we go down inside the atomic nucleus, we find there the protons and neutrons, the size scale that they have is order 10 to the minus 15 meters or femtometers. They're held in the nucleus by uh, the strong interaction between the protons and the neutrons. But we know the proton is not a fundamental particle. We can go down inside the proton and the constituents of the proton are quarks, which is the subject of the talk. Uh, today, are quarks fundamental particles? Again, at the moment, as far as we know, they are. But um, we would like, the, so the quark and the electron form part of our current standard model of particle physics, but we know that there are gaps, there are, there's an incompleteness uh, about the standard model. So there must be some new physics somewhere. And um, there are two basic approaches to finding that new physics. One is either finding new particles directly at very high energy accelerators. So for example, the, the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, or to find new physics indirectly through discrepancies between experimental results and what we expect for those results doing calculations in the standard model. Now, since we haven't found anything, of course, we need, we know these discrepancies are very small, and that means doing calculations and experiment to get very precise results to uncover very small um, differences. Now in particle physics we sort of think about this as going down in distance scale to smaller and smaller distances but this is connected to the physics of the universe on very large distance scales and new physics that we find, or we hope to find here, will affect the evolution of the universe, the existence of dark matter, and so on. So that's the name of the game. Here's the standard model um, that we have at the moment. I've just given a blob to every particle, and uh, the quarks are here as the blue bobs. Um, I've so there are six and I've lined them up as three pairs. The leptons also appear as three pairs. Now the left-hand pair here, both of the quarks and the leptons are the particles that appear in ordinary matter. So um, they appear within the atom. So for example, protons and neutrons are made of up and down quarks. And as we know, the electrons are circulating around those in atoms. Why we have these additional pairs, we don't know. They're essentially copies of this left-hand pair, but with heavier masses. So the strange and charm quarks have heavier masses than the up and down, and the bottom and top quarks have heavier masses still. Likewise, the muon is a cousin of the electron that's heavier, and the tau is heavier still. These are the neutrinos at the bottom, and we don't know what their masses are as yet. So, these then, uh, these particles experience the forces of the standard model and at down at the quantum level, we can think about those forces as being mediated by force carriers. And here are the force carriers in purple. Now the quarks feel all the forces actually, both uh, the strong force, the weak force and the electromagnetic force. I'm ignoring gravity here actually, so apologies to astronomers out there, but gravity has very little impact. Uh, in particle physics. Um, so the quarks feel all the forces, but actually their behavior is largely governed by the strong interaction, and they are the only particles to feel the strong interaction. And here's the, the gluon, which is the force carrier of the strong interaction. Then we've got the W and Z bosons of the weak force. And the weak force is important, or at least it's going to appear in my narrative, because um, this is one of the places, weak force interactions are one of the places where we believe um, is the best place to look uh, for new physics. And then we've got electromagnetism and the force carrier, which is the photon. Now we also have the Higgs particle that was discovered relatively recently at the Large Hadron Collider. And um, 
that gives mass to these particles. But one of the questions that we're interested in for the Higgs is, is, is the Higgs particle the Higgs that we were expecting in the standard model or not? I mean, could there be new physics in the Higgs particle? And of course, discuss or discovering how the Higgs couples to other particles, including how it couples to quarks, uh, is important in that story. So having laid out the standard model, then let's think about some of these interactions. And in particular, we want to think about the, the strong interaction that's governed by the theory called quantum chromodynamics or QCD for short. But it's actually very like the uh, theory of quantum electrodynamics or QED, which is the quantum theory of electromagnetism. So let's just sort of compare them side by side here. And uh, QED, in QED, we have electrically charged particles that uh, experience a force between them. And the sort of prototypical electrically charged particle is the electron. So two electrons might experience a force. Um, and at the quantum level, we think about that force as coming from the exchange of the force carrier, in this case, the photons. And photons have no electric charge but electrons do. So we can um, draw diagrams to show that interaction. And at every vertex where, so for example, we've got two electrons here interacting by exchanging the photon. At every vertex of these diagrams, we have to put the coupling, the coupling between the electron and the photon appears. And for QED, this is basically the electric charge of the electron, which is a very small number. If we think about a more detailed version of this interaction, we can we can add more complicated interactions to it. So if we were actually trying to work out what the scattering rate was here, for example, this would be um, the lowest order uh, diagram that we would write down. And then we could write down more complicated diagrams like this one, in which the photon splits into an E plus E minus pair that then goes back into a photon and then reconnects with the electron on the right hand side. And this diagram has more factors of the electric charge in because it's got more of these vertices in, which means that the numerical size of this diagram, the impact of this diagram in terms of what's happening with this scattering is much, much smaller than this leading order diagram. And so we can see in this way, this is called a perturbative expansion. We can see that this converges actually very quickly. You don't need a huge number of diagrams here don't need much complication to the interactions in order to get a very accurate result. So we can do perturbation theory in QED and get very accurate results. So that's one point to note. Um, the second point I should just point out here, because we'll come back to this later, is that actually this E plus E minus pair here could have been a quark antiquark because quarks also have uh, electric charge. So later on, we'll, we'll um, come upon an interaction which a photon goes to quark, anti-quark, and back to a photon again. <clears throat> Another point to note here about this interaction, though, is that this uh, diagram, which a photon goes to an E plus E minus pair and back to a photon, actually causes a screening of the electric charge. So as far as this right-hand electron is concerned, seeing this left-hand electron, uh, in this diagram, it just sees the electric charge, if you like, but E plus E minus pairs um, that appear because of this diagram actually screen this electric charge. So this electron will see a lower electric charge from this left-hand electron because of this screening. It's a very small effect for QED, um, but nevertheless, it's there. So now let's write down the sort of analog diagrams for QCD or quantum chromodynamics. We'll see they're very similar diagrams, but actually, just because of a few little details, they give completely different physics. So QCD is the quantum theory of the strong interaction. And there um, we have particles that have color charge. And it's color charge that enables a strong interaction rather than electric charge as here. And color charge is different. It's not just a number which can be positive or negative. It's a, it's a number for the charge, but then it comes in three possible colors, which we, I mean, it's nothing to do with real color. Color is just a name in this context, and we call them uh, red, green, and blue. And quarks have color charge, but the, ch the force 
the, the uh, force carrier, the gluon, also has color charge in this theory because of this multiplicity of color. And indeed, gluons have a color and an anti-color. So if we write down the analog of this diagram for QCD, then we can have a blue quark emitting a blue anti-green gluon here and becoming then, as a consequence, a green quark, but then interacts with the green quark that absorbs this gluon and becomes a blue quark. And if we then want to, um, and, and at each vertex of this diagram, as in the QED case, we put down the, the, the um, coupling between the quarks and the gluons. And that's actually a big number in QCD. It's much larger than the electric charge in uh, QED. If we draw the equivalent of these diagrams in the QCD case, so we have the same diagram, in which a gluon makes a green, blue, quark antiquark pair here. So that diagram is completely analogous to this one, but because gluons have color charge, we also have this diagram, which a gluon splits into two gluons and then back into a gluon. Now this, so this diagram has a screening effect on the color charge, just in the same way that this had a screening effect. But this diagram in which a gluon splits into two gluons has an anti-screening effect on the color charge. And what that means is that this quark here on the right hand side, as a result of this diagram, sees a bigger charge, bigger color charge for this quark than without this diagram. And what this means is that the effective color charge seen by two interacting quarks, so the effective charge of the other quark that they see, grows with distance. And in particular, it becomes very strong as the distance becomes large. And what this means is that um, a strong interaction has this confining property. You can never separate two colored particles because the interaction strength grows as um, the particles are separated. So this means that quarks are never seen as free particles. They can only appear as bound states called hadrons. And inside a hadron, the color charges all have to cancel out so that the hadron itself has no net color charge. And here's a picture of a hadron. This is one made of three quarks. So it's the kind of hadron that we call a baryon. Protons and neutrons are examples of baryons. And when you have three quarks in a baryon like this, then they'll all have different colors. So red, green, and blue here. And that is a color cancellation uh, situation so that this baryon would have zero color charge. The meson is the other type of hadron that we see uh, is very common. And a meson has as its basic constituents a quark and an antiquark. So they have a matching color and anti-color, so red, anti-red, or blue, anti-blue. And that is a more obviously color canceling situation. So mesons can also um, exist as hadrons because they have can have zero color charge. So then the question arises, and this is the basic quandary of the quark, how do we study quarks when we never see them uh, as free particles? So this is the quandary of quark. And this is a bit like, um, how would you decide what a baked bean looked like if you were never allowed to open the tin? It's a major complication in testing the standard model of particle physics, because our fundamental theories describe quarks but what we see in experiment are hadrons. And if we want to understand the properties of quarks or how the properties of quarks can be tested through experiment, then we have to be able to connect the properties of quarks to the properties of hadrons. So for example, if we look at this picture from a particle uh, collider, this is a picture in which a meson, which is the is called a BS meson, it contains a bottom and an anti-strange quark, it decays to a DS meson, which contains a charm and an anti-strange quark, and emits a W boson of the weak interaction. So this is an example of a quark weak interaction happening. And here's the electron from the W boson, and then the DS meson goes on to decay to kaons and a pion. If we look at that in detail, we see that it's a quark level process in which a quark emits a W boson. We'll talk a bit more about these kind of interactions later. But, um, to understand this process through a quark level um, process, 
we have to have an accurate, full, fully non-perturbative treatment of QCD so that we can connect our theory containing quarks, i.e. QCD, with what we see in the experiment uh, for hadrons. If we can do that, and we can using the numerical uh, techniques of lattice QCD, then we can compare standard model expectations based on the theory with experimental uh, measurements that will either provide very stringent tests of the standard model or allow us to search for new physics. And at the same time as doing this, as we'll see, we can determine standard model parameters for quarks. So for example, the quark masses. This is the only way that we can determine quark masses. And uh, in this particular example, we want to know what the coupling is between these quarks, the bottom quark and the charm quark, and the W boson. So, as we've said, um, hadrons consist of uh, quarks in a very strongly interacting environment. So we can think of them um, as the basic quarks that make up the hadron. Those are called the valence quarks in a background soup, which is the QCD vacuum. So here's a picture of a hadron just to, to sort of illustrate this idea and it's a baryon. So I've got the three valence quarks that are the, the basic constituents. So they, if, they, if this was a proton, these would be two up quarks and a down quark. And they are three different colors so that the hadron itself has, has net color charge zero. These are the big blobs here. But as we say, those valence quarks are living in this strongly interacting soup. And these wiggly lines are the gluons in that background soup that create this strongly interacting environment. And the gluons just pop in and out of the vacuum through energy fluctuations. But the gluons can also make quark antiquark pairs, as we've seen, that then go back into gluons. And so there are quark antiquark pairs in this background soup as well. And these are called the C quarks, SEA quarks here. And I've, I've illustrated these with little, little blobs. <laughs> I mean, they're quarks, just the same as the valence quarks are, and they're the same kind of quarks, obviously, but um, they live in this background C. So um, this is the kind of picture that we have of hadrons. And the question is then, how do they appear within our theoretical calculations? Um, as I've said, lattice QCD is the way to provide a fun, you know, from first principles, an ab initio approach to the theory QCD of the strong interactions. And we do that using the Feynman path integral formulation of the theory. So I'll go through some of the steps in the calculation, I'm not going to give you any technical details, I think that would be too tedious, but I want to give you some idea of, of what the issues are uh, with the calculations. So the first point here is that um, we're working in um, a four, on a four-dimensional space-time lattice. That's why we call it lattice QCD. Here's a picture of a lattice on the right here. The convention is to call the spacing between the points of the lattice A, the lattice spacing. Now, this is uh, obviously, this is not a four dimensional lattice, it's just a picture, two dimensional picture of the three dimensional lattice, but we're working in four dimensional space time, obviously, in a box of four dimensional space time discretized as a lattice. And we have to then discretize the equations of QCD onto this lattice. And we define the quark and gluon fields that appear in the theory so that they take values on the lattice points here, which are a discrete set of points. So this enables us to keep things finite and you can then put this calculation onto a computer if you can discretize the equations of QCD onto the lattice, which we can. Now just some an order of magnitude here, just so you see what we're what we're working with. A typical lattice that we'll that we'll be using will have a lattice spacing of about 0.1 femtometers. Remember I said the size of a proton was about one femtometer. Um, and the number of points in the lattice will be 50, something like 50 in each of the four dimensions, so 50 to the fourth lattice. So that gives us uh, five femtometers on each side of a four dimensional box. And that's big enough to have a hadron inside there without squeezing it unnecessarily so that you can do a, a realistic calculation of things like the mass of a hadron, which is what we want to do. So the steps in the calculation I've got, I've divided it into three steps here. So the first step is to uh, generate what we call typical snapshots of the QCD vacuum according to the path integral. 
And the path integral here, I've just uh, sketched out the, the sort of basic integral. It tells us to integrate du here over all possible gluon fields on our four dimensional uh, space time. U is the conventional name for the gluon field in lattice QCD. It's a, it's a matrix over the points. Um, I mean, it has, it has a value at each of the points on the lattice, and it's also, because it's got color and anti-color charge, it's actually a three by three matrix um, at each of these points in each of the directions. So it really sits on the links of the lattice. And the path integral would tell us to integrate over all possible values that gluon field can take, but not all values of the gluon field are equal. They come with a weighting, which is e to the minus the action of the theory. The action is the integral over the Lagrangian of the theory, and it's a function of the fields. If we were to take this uh, integral seriously, and we were working with a 50 to the fourth lattice, this would mean a multi million dimensional integral, which obviously we can't do. But instead, what we can do is concentrate on those configurations of gluon fields that contribute most to the path integral. Those will be the ones with the largest value of e to the minus s, or the smallest value of s. And if, in fact, we go um, one step beyond that and we generate gluon fields with a probability distribution, which is e to the minus s, and there are Monte Carlo algorithms with which you can do this, then all you have to do to implement this path integral is actually take these gluon fields with that distribution and calculate things on them and simply average over them. And when you do that averaging because of the probability distribution here, that will do the path integral for you. So we can do this. It's incredibly uh, computationally demanding if you want to include the impact of the sequox. And obviously we do because that is needed for a realistic picture of QCD. Now, I haven't said anything about quarks here, and actually the sequark, uh, sequarks are not explicit here because quark fields anti-commute. I don't know if you remember this from, from perhaps discussing this um, in your undergraduate courses. So they don't obey you know, the standard uh, arithmetic that numbers obey on the computer. So um, instead they're implicit, they appear in this probability distribution via the determinant of the matrix that, that we can denote M which encodes the Dirac equation uh, within it. And that's how the sequarks appear in this probability distribution. As I say, it's, it's a computationally very demanding um, process, but nevertheless, we can nowadays, nowadays do it on very powerful uh, supercomputers. Once we've got these gluon field configurations with this probability distribution, then we calculate how the valence quarks propagate through these gluon fields. And that means solving the Dirac equation. And that is equivalent to inverting this matrix M that encodes the uh, Dirac equation. So here's the matrix M uh, down here. It takes this form. Um, if you remember uh, possibly your Dirac equation, gamma here, if, if you don't, it doesn't matter. Um, gamma are the four by four matrices that appear in the Dirac equation. Capital D here is a covariant derivative that includes coupling with the gluon fields, because as these valence quarks propagate through the gluon fields, they interact with them. And that's represented by this gamma dot D term. And then we have the quark mass M here. And different quarks only differ by the fact that they've got a different mass. Actually, everything else about the uh, QCD setup is exactly the same for all the quarks. So to solve the Dirac equation means inverting this matrix M. And it's a huge matrix because the quarks live on all the sides of the lattice. And they have four spins and three colors. Um, this is actually a 12 times n, where n, as I say, could be 50 to the fourth times 12 times n matrix, so it's enormous uh, to invert that, is also computationally demanding. And it's particularly expensive if the quark mass here is very small, because that means this matrix is ill-conditioned with very small eigenvalues. And for the up and down quarks, which are obviously very important in particle physics, um, partly because they're the lightest quarks, um, this becomes very expensive. So once we've got these valence quark propagators, then we combine them together to make objects that we call hadron correlation functions. Then we average those hadron correlation functions over all the gluon field configurations that we have, and that performs the path integral for us. So then we get the hadron correlation function that would come out of a path integral, but calculated numerically uh, in lattice QCD. And then we analyze these correlation functions to obtain 
quantities like hadron masses and hadron decay amplitudes. So here's a picture of a meson correlation function here. It consists of a quark propagator, this blue line here, and an anti-quark propagator joined together, literally. And uh, we join them together so that the colors match up and they've got the right spin operators here. I've represented that by this operator OA at time zero. And then we do the same thing at time T to, to close them off again. So this correlation function means basically uh, create a meson at time zero, allow it to propagate to time capital T and then destroy it. And that's what the correlation function is. We average it over all gluon field configurations and then we have to fit it as a function of this time here, capital T, between the creation and destruction of the meson. Now you might think this is just a meson propagating and you'd expect to get an offset. So if we imagine um, that we've set this up, so there's zero spatial momentum here, then the energy of the meson is just its mass. That translates into the frequency with which we could have a meson wave propagating in time. So we'd expect this to behave as e to the imt, for example. But because we're in Euclidean space-time, actually the e to the imt is translated into an e to the minus mt. And that's very important here because if we think about this meson correlation function, when I say we create a meson here, of course, we don't, we create a quark antiquark pair, and that could represent several mesons. If you think about solving the wave function for the hydrogen atom, you have the ground state energy, then you have radial excitation energies and so on. You have exactly the same thing for mesons. So we have a ground state meson made of a particular quark and antiquark. That's the one with the lightest mass, but then there will be radial excitations with different wave functions that will have higher masses and be heavier. They all appear in this correlation function. So when we fit it, we have to include all of these states in the correlation function. But the lightest mass will be the one that has the biggest e to the minus mt factor if we make t large. So we can go to large t and this correlation function will become saturated by the ground state meson in this channel. And um, enable us to get the ground state masses relatively accurately. You can still, by fitting multiple states, you can get these excited meson masses as well. But the one that you get most accurately is the ground state meson mass. So that will be typically the one that I focus on because I'm talking about precision uh, lattice QCD calculations here. And these amplitudes are related to amplitudes to create this meson from the vacuum with this operator or destroy it. And so these can be related to decay processes for that meson, for example, the meson annihilating to a W boson. So given this uh, fitting, we can extract, for example, the meson masses, um, and they are given to us in lattice units from the lattice calculation. So we have to determine the lattice spacing in order to convert them to physical units. And we also have to fix the quark mass because this is a parameter of QCD that QCD doesn't know what the quark masses are. So we have to fix the quark masses by using calibration hadron masses. We adjust the quark mass until the calibration hadron mass is right. And then we use that quark mass for that quark in every other hadron uh, that it appears. And we likewise use a calibration hadron mass to determine what the lattice spacing is. So these are just the very few parameters that QCD has, lattice spacing and a mass for each type of quark. We then have to repeat this calculation at another value of the lattice spacing, and then we have to extrapolate results, I'll show you uh, some of those in a minute, to zero lattice spacing because the continuous real world that we live in doesn't have a lattice and so to compare to experiment we need results at lattice spacing equals zero and then the final accuracy you get and the answer depends on how many gluon field configurations you had what your statistics was how well you can control these discretization errors from discretizing the equations of qcd onto the lattice these are the things that you're extrapolating away by working at multiple values of the lattice spacing, but um, you need a good discretization of the QCD equation, so they're not very big. How well you've tuned the quark masses and issues to do with normalization if you're looking at decay amplitudes. 
So here I'm just going to flash up briefly some parameters of gluon field configurations that we're using. The x-axis gives you the lattice facing. So we've got so each blue blob represents a set of gluon field configurations, and we've got results all the way from um, these lattices here, which have a lattice spacing of 0.15 fermis, all the way down to these very fine lattices that have a lattice spacing of smaller than 0.05 fermis. So here um, I'm showing some results for the DS meson mass. This is a charm anti-strange meson in which we've already fixed the charm mass and the strange mass from other mesons. And then we ask, what is the answer for the DS meson mass uh, from lattice QCD? So as I've described, you get results at multiple values of the lattice spacing here. They're plotted against the square of the lattice spacing, and then you extrapolate them to zero lattice spacing to get our result, which is this green band here. And the experimental result is this black burst here. So you can see that our result is very accurate. These are in um, GeV units that we use for uh, particle physics masses. Um, the mass of the proton is around one GeV. So you can see that um, we're measuring the mass to, to, um, to a few MeV, so a few thousandths of a GeV accuracy and getting good agreement with experiment. We do these calculations, I've said they're computationally very, uh, very challenging. We do them on the UK's uh, high performance computing facility that's funded by STFC for theoretical astronomy and nuclear and particle physics. So it's, it's a great facility, it's called Dirac. And in particular, we use the, the so-called data intensive system. There are different systems with somewhat different architectures for different calculations. We use the system that's called the data intensive system at Cambridge. It's a, it's a powerful machine, over two petaflops in total, working uh, as a parallel set of, of CPUs so that you do a calculation distributed over multiple cores uh, joined by an InfiniBand interconnect. And even, even given this power, lattice QCD calculations take weeks on these computers and millions of uh, core hours to execute. This, mach this machine is currently being upgraded, so we'll get new power, uh, new improved computer power uh, later this year for even better calculations, which is great. So let me show you some results now. Um, this is a sort of summary, if you like, of the masses of mesons. I'm focusing here on the mesons that are very well determined in experiment and that can be well determined in lattice QCD because I say I want to do precision tests here. So these are typically, not always, but typically the ground state meson uh, made of that quark antiquark pair. And the red lines here represent the experimental results and the points represent the lattice QCD calculations. And the points are divided into the pink crosses which are the calibration masses that we used either to determine the lattice spacing or to fix the quark mass. So um, these uh, particles up here are known as upsilon particles. They're made of bottom anti bottom. We use the upsilon itself, the ground state upsilon, to fix the bottom quark mass, the B quark mass. And we use the splitting between the upsilon and its first radial excitation, the upsilon prime to fix the lattice spacing. So that's why both of those are given pink crosses. We use uh, the so-called E to C particle, which is made of charm and anti-charm to fix the charm quark mass. We use the pion uh, to fix the up and down quark masses. And we use a particle called the kaon to fix the strange quark mass. And then all the other masses here of mesons, there are no free parameters left in QCD. They're all given by our lattice QCD calculations. So you can see they divide into light particles down here, which contain up, down and strange part uh, quarks, and then a set of heavier mesons here, which contain charm quarks. These ones contain charm quarks along with um, light or strange quarks. So here's the D sub S that we were talking about just earlier. And this is a set of mesons that contain charm and anti-charm, so-called charmonium system. Then heavier still, because bottom quarks are even heavier, are particles containing bottom quarks. These are particles containing bottom quarks with up, down, and strange. The B sub C is a bottom quark with an anti-charm quark. And then there's a set of particles that are bottom, anti-bottom up here. Now the points here are given a blue square if the lattice calculation came after the experiment, or a green circle if the lattice calculation came before the experiment. They're more valuable in the sense that, you know, experimentalists really believe us. If we tell them the answer before they find the particle, 
and um, there you can see quite a lot of successful green circles here. Um, my particular favourite, because <laughs> it was quite a stressful time doing this calculation, is that of the beast of C meson. So this is the Grand State Bottom Anti-Charm meson, whose mass we predicted ahead of the discovery or the, the first sighting of it in experiment uh, by the CDF experiment back in 2005. So I should say um, that obviously there are uh, there are more hadrons than this. I'm just showing you these particular ones that are accurately determined. But there is a whole area of lattice QCD in which people look at these uh, excited and unstable particles and indeed look for particles that are not just the standard quark antiquark for meson or three quarks for barium. So so-called tetraquarks and pentaquarks. Um, that's a lot more challenging in many ways. And the calculations, because they're harder, they're nowhere near as precise, but it's uh, it's an important area of lattice QCD that's making a lot of progress. So given this picture of meson masses, let me um, return to answer the question of what is the mass of a quark? So obviously quark masses are important fundamental parameters, but how do you define them if you don't have a quark? You know, an electron, you can just see an electron, for example, um, executing a circle in a magnetic field, and we, you can use that to uh, determine its mass, but you can't do that with quarks because they're not available as free particles. What you mean by the quark mass then is the parameter that you need to put in to the QCD Lagrangian, the QCD action, in order to get the right result compared to experiment for the mass of a hadron that contains that quark. So for example, uh, I said here that we use the eta C meson to fix the charm mass. It's actually somewhat better to use the J psi meson, which is a vector particle with vector quantum numbers made of charm anti-charm. And that's what we've been using more recently to fix the charm mass. So we adjust the charm mass in our lattice QCD calculation at multiple values of the lattice spacing to get the right answer for the J psi meson mass in GeV. And this can actually be done very, very accurately, so to better than 0.1%. However, the issue is that people working in um, the continuum um, with QCD, for example, people who are interested in how the Higgs boson couples to charm quarks, if they want to work out what to expect, what to expect for the rate of Higgs decay to charm anti-charm, they want a charm quark mass which is defined not on a lattice but in a continuum, we say a continuum regularization scheme for QCD. So we have to match our lattice quark masses to the continuum. This is why they're called M bar because it's a particular choice of continuum definition of the quark mass um, so that these continuum people can do that. However, that there are ways of doing this. Indeed, there are multiple ways of doing this now. And so what I'm showing you here are lattice results for the charm quark mass um, to show you how accurate they are. So there are three results here using three different methods of um, converting the lattice mass to the continuum mass. And they all agree very well and they have an accuracy that's better than 1%. Our recent calculation, which is this blue one here, actually was so accurate that we included the effect of the electric charge of the charm quark. So the fact that the J psi meson has a charm and an anti-charm quark in it, and they have opposite electric charges, so there's uh, electrical attraction there between them, um, which lowers the, the, the meson mass slightly. We included that effect in our tuning of the quark mass and our determination of the charm quark mass. Uh, it's a very, very small effect, but we put it in. Uh, so the result that we obtain for the charm quark mass, you can see, is 1.27 in these GeV units. Remember, the proton is a bit less than, than one GeV here, so it's heavier than a, a proton charm quark. Uh, and you can see that we have an accuracy that's much less uh, than one percent. So we're giving really precise quark masses to continuum theorists who can then compare to LHC uh, experiments on the Higgs. And we can do this for other quarks as well. I'm just showing the example of the charm quark here because that's a particularly recent and particularly accurate calculation. So let's go on to look at some other uh, calculations associated with the weak force. I said that the weak force was an important force um, because it might give us an in to finding uh, new physics. So quarks also feel the weak force. 
and they can change from one type to another, emitting a W boson of the weak force. And indeed, we see that uh, in nuclear beta decay. If you think about what nuclear beta decay is at a fundamental level, it's uh, a neutron changing to a proton inside a nucleus. But if we go down inside the neutron and proton, it's really a down quark emitting a W boson and becoming an up quark. And the W boson decays to an electron and an antineutrino. So this is the beta particle, the electron. Now, other quarks do that as well. So, for example, the picture we saw back at the beginning, B sub S meson here emitting a W boson and becoming a D sub S meson. This is really a bottom quark inside the B sub S meson changing into a charm quark. But because this is happening inside hadrons here, it's a quark level process, but it's happening inside a hadron, then we need lattice QCD to work out what the impact of QCD and the fact that these quarks are confined is on the weak decay rate. And if we can do that, we can then compare the weak decay rate that we get to what we see in experiment. And that enables us to get out the coupling between the quarks and the W boson. So there's a whole matrix of these couplings. It's called the Kabibo Kobayashi Maskawa matrix over so every appropriate pair of quarks that can couple to a W boson. There's an element for this CKM matrix. And this matrix in the standard model is a unitary matrix. So if we can determine what the elements are, we can test if it's a unitary matrix. If it's not, that tells us there's some new physics somewhere. Or if we determine the elements from different processes, and get different answers, then that also tells us this new physics somewhere. So there's several processes for each element here that uh, enable us to get a value. Now, we think weak interactions are a good place to look for new physics, A, because they're quite weak, so new physics could have an impact, but also because weak physics, weak interactions violate all sorts of very basic symmetries, such as parity or mirror symmetry. So I'm just going to show you some results for a calculation of D to K decay here, which gives us access to this element VCS. So this is a charm quark inside a D meson that decays to a strange quark. And so this meson becomes a K meson. And the VCS element appears here at this, at this coupling between the quarks and the W boson. And the experimental result then is equal to the square of VCS times a quantity that parameterizes all the strong interactions, the QCD that's happening here. And this uh, parameter is called the form factor for this decay. So it encodes uh, the structure of the mesons as well and how the QCD is holding these quarks inside the mesons while they're undergoing this weak interaction. And it's a function of the momentum. It's not just a single number. It's a function of the momentum of this meson, uh, the daughter meson, from this interaction. If we can get accurate experimental results for this process and, and do accurate lattice QCD calculations, then we can get an accurate value for VCS. And that's what we've managed to do recently. So what we have to do on the lattice is actually, instead of calculating those hadron correlation functions that I showed you earlier, which we call two point functions because they had a time zero and a time T, we have to calculate something called a three point function, which has three T values. So we have a charm quark propagator here, and then we insert an operator J, which couples to the W boson. And then we have a strange quark propagator going from this point, which is at little t, to the end point, capital T. And then we have a light quark that goes all the way from zero to T. This is light quark is what we call the spectator to this, um, this weak decay. So this is a three point correlation function. We just calculated on the lattice in the same way that we did the two point correlation functions average overall gluon field configurations and fit as a function of little t and big T to determine these things called form factors. And here's a picture of our form factors here in blue and red. The points here are our actual lattice data taken at multiple values of the lattice spacing. And we fit everything as a function of lattice spacing and we determine these lines which are our final results of the form factors. Then we take those form factors, we square them basically and take the experimental, so we've got lots of different experimental measurements of the rate for this decay binned in momentum, which is represented here by Q squared. So each experiment gives various values for the rate in different momentum bins. And from our form factors, we can reconstruct what the rate in that bin should be 
up to the factor of VCS, which is the CKM element that would sit at the vertex with the W boson. So for each experiment and each Q squared bin, we get a value for VCS, and then we just fit these all to a constant, and it gives us this purple band result here. So the first point is the fact that, that we get the same value for all the Q squared bins already tells you that this is a very good test of QCD because we're getting the right structure for the mesons in this um, momentum transfer process, which is happening through this weak decay. But we can get a very accurate value of VCS out of this, and this is a much better value than we had before. It's, and on this plot down here in the right hand corner, we show this new value, which is this dark blue band on a plot which shows other values of VCS obtained from actually from annihilation to a W boson under the DS meson, that's this pink band here, and also values of VCD. Because we want to test the unitarity of this second row of the CKM matrix here, which tells us VCD squared plus VCS squared plus VCB squared should be one if this make if this row is unitary. VCB has a value, it's very small actually, but um, what I'm plotting then is VCD against VCS, and I'm setting this unitarity line, taking account of VCB as this black dashed line here. So you can see that our blue band here is consistent with, with unitarity given the values of VCD that we have, but it can't really distinguish between this different, this, this rather large spread at the moment of values of VCD. So another weak interaction process that's very important is that of neutral B meson oscillations. So let me say a little about this um, because it's a complete analog of what you see in the continuum with coupled pendulums. So you know if you take two identical pendulums and you couple them together, perhaps by hanging them from a common support, then the oscillation modes that have a single frequency, i.e. that, that that perform a pure oscillation actually couple the two pendulums together. There is no mode in which only one pendulum is swinging. There are two modes because we've got two pendulums and I've called, given them frequencies omega one and omega two. Omega one is the mode in which the two pendulums are swinging backwards and forwards together. And omega two is the mode in which the two pendulums are swinging out of phase with each other. And the difference between these two frequencies, omega one and omega two, if you if you do this calculation, depends on the coupling uh, between the two pendulums, and it can be very small. If you make that coupling very small, it can be very much less than either of these frequencies. But what this coupling does is actually introduces rather counterintuitive behaviour. If you look at the how these couple pendulums work, if you set one pendulum going at time t equals zero, then the motion, if you have omega one minus omega two actually much smaller than the average frequency, you get a motion in which uh, the motion sloshes backwards and forwards between pendulum one and pendulum two. So pendulum one starts here and has this um, high frequency behavior modulated by this low frequency omega one minus omega two. And pendulum two is half a mode set by the omega minus omega one minus omega two frequency um, further on than that. So you get this sloshing backwards and forwards of motion from pendulum one to pendulum two. Exactly the same thing can happen for uh, B mesons that are made of bottom anti-strange and bottom anti-down. These are electrically neutral mesons and they can mix through the weak interactions with their anti-particles. So for example, the B sub S, a bottom anti-strange, can mix with the anti-B sub S, which is an anti-bottom strange. Through this diagram, which is called a box diagram, in which W bosons and top quarks circulate round. And this contains obviously the CKM elements VTB, which we know very well sitting here, and then the element VTS or VTD, if this is a B sub D meson, that we don't know very well sitting at this point. And what this means is that these two mesons are coupled together. The eigenstates of this system are mixtures of B, B sub Q and anti B sub Q. Indeed, uh, they're equal mixtures of um, B sub Q and anti B sub Q. So if you create a B sub Q through an interaction, it's really a mixture of the two eigenstates. And the two eigenstates have slightly different frequencies, just in the couple pendulum case, i.e. slightly different masses. They get out of step as you progress in time. 
And what you see then when the particle decays is that it can decay as a, a piece of Q or an anti piece of Q. Because at the decay point, um, you know, it has to say which, um, at what point, you know, the, what the, uh, the motion has oscillated to at that point. So the experimentalists can do this, they can see the oscillations. Here's a picture from the LHCB experiment in which they're, they're looking at um, B sub S oscillations, and you can see they get this picture, oscillatory picture, when they um, tag a decay mode to see whether um, a B Q bar decayed as a B Q bar or a B bar Q. And they can measure this mass difference between the two eigenstates that's causing this oscillation uh, by measuring this frequency, and they can, they can determine it very accurately. We have to calculate this matrix element in lattice QCD, which we can do. We you use three point functions in the same way as the previous calculation. And by comparing the, the lattice QCD calculation to the experimental results, we can determine VTS or VTD, depending on whether we look at BCS or BCD oscillations. And the results that, that we got from a recent calculation that we did in 2019 are given on this VTS, VTD curve by this black lozenge here. And what we want to compare here is to this green lozenge, which you get from assuming unitarity of the CKM matrix. And these lozenges just have plus or minus one standard deviation error bars here. And so actually these agree reasonably well. So once again, the CKM matrix does actually seem to be unitary and we haven't seen new physics there. Let me go on to talk very briefly about the magnetic moment of the muon just because that's something that's been in the news recently. So leptons, the electron, the muon and the tau, they have electric charge and spin. So they have a magnetic moment, confusingly also called mu. So be careful with the notation here, uh, which is related to their spin. It's given by a factor, the electric charge divided by two M times this Londe G factor. Now the G factor would be two in the Dirac equation, but because we're working in a full, I mean, the, the real world has a full, uh, quantum theory attached to it, then G is actually not equal to two. <clears throat> and we call the anomaly or the anomalous magnetic moment, the difference of G from two <clears throat> divided by two. The biggest effect on um, meaning that G isn't two comes from QED correction. So you can take this basic diagram in which a muon interacts magnetically with a photon, gives us the magnetic moment. And um, you can put a, a photon across it, and that's the leading contribution that appears at order uh, alpha in QED, in the per perturbative expansion in QED, that was calculated back in 1948 by Schwinger, and that diagram gives you a contribution to A mu, which is alpha over 2 pi, which is 0 0.00116. You can obviously add more photons, do higher order calculations in QED, and the people who do this have done incredible calculation up to alpha to the fifth now, um, calculated this anomaly very accurately. So again, it's one of these uh, cases in which if we can calculate something very accurately and we can measure it very accurately and we can compare any discrepancy then could be a sign of new physics. So for example, new X and Y particles that couple to the muon and the photon and affect the magnetic moment in this way. Astonishingly, we can, it turns out, A, do these calculations very accurately and B, the measurements. And that's recently what's been in the news is a new experimental measurement coming from Fermilab. The way they did the measurements was to feed polarized anti-muons, in fact, rather than muons, into a ring in which they had a magnetic field uh, perpendicular to the ring. The spin of the muons then processes around the magnetic field. And the question is, how does the spin precession compare to the, mo the, the way that the momentum of the um, muon changes direction as it goes around the ring. If G was two, the spin and the momentum would, would keep track with each other in terms of direction. But if G is not equal to two, the spin will precess somewhat faster than the momentum is, is going around, which is the cyclotron frequency. And you can measure the muon spin from the direction of electrons when the muon decays. And this uh, allows you then to measure directly the difference of the spin and the cyclotron frequencies, which is directly related to the anomalous magnetic moment. In the theory calculation, we have to calculate all possible standard model contributions to this anomaly. 
And it turns out we've discussed the QED pieces, which have been calculated incredibly accurately using perturbation theory. The least well-known contribution here is actually the QCD contribution. And this is a contribution in which a muon emits a photon, which becomes a quark anti-quark pair with all sorts of strong interaction physics happening here, goes back into a photon. And this contribution needs to be calculated. And um, the way that we do it in lattice QCD is actually we think about what this central bubble is. We kind of extract that bubble from the diagram. And it looks like this, where this is a quark going around here, and this is an antiquark. And these two points have vector quantum numbers because they attach to a photon. And this is exactly the two point correlation function for a vector meson made of a quark and, and, and antiquark of a particular flavor. So this is a very straightforward calculation in principle to do in lattice QCD. And then you just have to integrate it with particular kinematic factors to work out its contribution to the anomalous magnetic moment of the muon. And lattice QCD calculations are proceeding uh, on these cases. We've done very accurate calculations for strange quarks and charm quarks. But for up and down quarks, it's actually very difficult to do these calculations because it turns out that you need the correlation function to go to very large times because the up and down quark masses are so light. And there's a lot of noise appearing in the correlator then at large times. So the up and down contribution, which is unfortunately the biggest, still has a lot of noise in it. And lattice QCD calculations are not yet accurate enough for this. Alternatively, you can use experimental results. This is not an ab initio method, but you can use experimental results for uh, the E plus E minus goes to hadrons cross section. And that is what people are doing at the moment. So let me just show you a summary of the results. Um, this is the experimental result from the recent experimental announcement here. This is in units of 10 to the minus 11. So notice how incredibly accurate the experiment is. You're, you're measuring this thing down to um, parts in, in 10 to the minus 10. And that's what this purple band is uh, on the, from the experimental paper. The result from the standard model, which comes from this theory white paper, is given below, also very, very accurate. And this is given by the green band here. And the discrepancy between them is 251 times 10 to the minus 11. And that represents this 4.2 sigma discrepancy between the experiment and the theory, which could be a very exciting hint of new physics. This shows you the, the QCD contribution over here. The red points on this plot are the accurate ones that have been used in this standard model green band here that come from using E plus E minus goes to hadrons data. The lattice results, you can see there's a lot of lattice calculations here, but they're not yet accurate enough to really tell us, um, you know, it'd be nice. We're expecting them to agree with the red points, but would, it would be good if we could get the accuracy down to the same level as the red points. And we haven't got that yet because we need more computing uh, to do that. So here's my conclusions. Um, let me leave you with those because I see that I have run over time. Um, just want to say there's a lot, a lot more to do here, improving our existing calculations and extending the range of them. And we will need better algorithms and faster computers to do that in future. Thanks to Dirac, we're able, uh, we're able to have a prospect of doing that. So thank you for listening. Uh, uh, well, well, thank you, thank you very much for for this, this fascinating talk and uh, and for giving us your time. Uh, we we did get one question in the middle of, of the uh, of, of the talk. I, I think if if people are quick, uh, then then there may be time for just one more. So so while I read out the, the question that we did receive, uh, feel free to 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 type any any other questions you may have. Uh, okay, so so the, the one question we did receive uh, is uh, let's see. Uh, given that QCD is similar in form to QED, in principle, yeah. is it possible at our current level of understanding to calculate the distribution of the center of mass of a hadron? Calculate the distribution of the center of mass. I'm not quite sure I understand mm. that question. Um, so, 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 we have a hadron structure. Uh, so, so if, 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 if the person who asks wants to clarify, you, you can uh, you, you can type in 
uh, another question with more information. Or are, are you asking how hadron mass is built up? I mean, a hadron mass is built up from, from the quark masses. I mean, perhaps that's something I should have made clearer, actually, at the point at which I was talking about determining quark masses. Um, I said here that we're tuning the quark mass in our, in our Lagrangian to get the experimental value for the hadron mass. The mass of the hadron is made up of the quark masses, but also the QCD binding energy. So obviously what we're doing in the lattice QCD calculation is really calculating accurately what the QCD binding energy is. If we look at a particle that contains charm quarks, so this J psi meson, then because the charm quark is, is a relatively heavy quark, actually most of the mass of the J psi meson does come from the charm quarks it contains. But if we look at uh, hadrons that have lighter quarks in them, so for example, the pi meson that contains up and down quarks, the up and down quark masses are very, very small. The pion mass, or indeed the proton mass, if you want to think about the proton mass, um, the proton contains two up quarks and a down quark, but the proton mass is much, much larger than that of the sum of the up and down quark masses that it contains. So most of the proton mass is actually you know, QCD binding energy. Uh, of of those quarks to make the proton was was that does that answer the question uh, i haven't i haven't oh uh, oh uh, uh, d, 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 d. Ah, ah yes i've, I've got to, got a follow up uh, on, on that so is a uh, is is the center of mass uh, perfectly stationary in a in in a hadron or does it that, that does it move around i think that's that's what the question was well, that's yes. So you're asking about the structure of a hadron. I mean, yes. So indeed, with lattice QCD, we can get information about about hadron hadron structure. And um, so, you know, obviously, if we're talking about a stationary hadron, then on average, its centre of mass is stationary, but inside the quarks are are moving around. And you can ask questions about um, how much momentum the quarks have, and so on. I mean, this is. You know, partly what we're doing here in this calculation, because this form factor encodes um, the distribution of quarks inside the hadron, so that when um, this meson here moves, when the the d meson emits a w boson and a k meson, and they have uh, different momenta, um, this form factor will be different depending on what that momentum is, because it's a question of how much um, momentum is imparted from this charm quark to this strange quark you know what impact that has on the on the k meson so this is this is one of a set of calculations in which you're really probing what what the structure of of hadrons is and how the quarks have what momentum distribution they have inside the hadron okay and then we got one more question uh, so the question is uh, in beta decay how do the other nucleons affect the decay of the quark within uh, the, the single newton that is, is decaying? Well, that's a nuclear physics question. So um, I wouldn't like to, to comment on that. I mean, they may at some level. This is a process that happens you know, inside a neutron in the nucleus. Um, but this, again, you know, coming back to structure, you know, we know that the structure of um, nucleons so neutrons and protons is affected by them being inside a nucleus at some level that's been shown in experiment uh, and so you might extrapolate from that that it could have an impact on um, the, the beta decay process um, but what i'm interested in particularly is is looking at single hadrons so um, to try and do nuclear physics even though in principle you could do it with lattice qcd it's incredibly complicated People are starting now to, to do it, actually, uh, and looking at very simple nuclei, like, for example, the deuteron, which is a, a, um, a neutron and a proton joined together. That's If you think about that in lattice QCD, then that's six quarks that you have to make a correlation function for and look for the mass of. Uh, so, you know, that's actually incredibly accurate, uh, incredibly complicated, and that's about the limit of what people can do. But people are starting to look at those kind of things in lattice QCD. So it will be a long time before people are actually doing um, detailed calculations on bigger uh, nuclei than that, even though in principle, it, you know, it is it is possible. Uh, 
Okay, I, I think that's the final question from the audience. But before we leave, I, I'd like to use Cho's privilege to ask one final question. Uh, so, so you spoke about how uh, you work, uh, uh, how your work is, in, involves Lattice QCD. Uh, do you have an opinion uh, about uh, uh, holographic gauge gravity duality approaches that have been suggested as a possible alternative way to do some of these calculations? Um, it, well, it's a question of accuracy, right? I mean, you know, it's it's um, there are models of QCD, and I think um, some of the the, the 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 things you're suggesting sort of come um, a bit under that heading in the sense that you know you can have nice features of a model that reproduce qualitatively the hadron spectrum, you know, and that can be an interesting thing. But what lattice QCD is about is about solving the theory of the strong interactions very precisely on the computer. So, um, you know, we can get results for um, masses, you know, that have errors that are, you know, um, one in a thousand type uh, errors on these masses. And that's then a very accurate, you know, a really very accurate test of QCD, and it's this kind of accuracy that we need uh, to find new physics. So um, I think approaches the kind that you're suggesting, you know, are, are interesting and have um, interesting insights to offer sometimes into, into QCD. But in terms of testing the standard model to destruction, uh, we need lattice, uh, the real uh, lattice QCD calculation. Okay, I think that, that that those are all the questions. So, so thank you again uh, for for a very fascinating talk, uh, um, and and for, for your time, and uh, to, to to our attendees. Uh, thank you, thank you all for coming as well. Just a reminder for our IOP members uh, that uh, the uh, uh, committee nominations uh, email will be in your inboxes uh, early next week. And this is this is the last talk for a little while in our uh, lecture schedule. Uh, but uh, do look out for emails uh, at some point over the summer uh, where, where we'll uh, uh, reveal our upcoming schedule for, uh, for the next lecture series. Uh, thank you, everyone. Great. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye.